And I'm asking you, and you, I mean, three of you, and myself too, are we always in kind of exile when we are writing? As Jewish writers? I'd like to think that most of the time we're not, because I think it would make our existence a real torture. Uh, but yes, I think in a manner of speaking, we are. Uh, but uh, it's the same as, you know, I was recently asked by a Russian interviewer sort of uh, whether immigration was a successful endeavor or not. And I said, you know, when I sit in shul and hear my daughter sing, I feel like it was a successful undertaking. <laughs> so I think basically uh, the, I think when we feel happy having written something as Jews, as writers, as human beings, it justifies our existence, uh, and in a way, the term exile is probably never uh, one that will do justice to it. Uh, uh, or perhaps uh, it is that umbrella that unites us. But I, I, I honestly think that it's less the space or the time, and perhaps not even the language, but perhaps a fabric, a texture of Jewishness that unites us. At least that's what I like to think uh, about all this, uh, right? Especially because it, it does survive in translation. I strongly dislike the notion of uh, lost in translation. That's Eva I Hoffman's think, book. I think, no, I like Eva Hoffman very much as a person, but I think it has led to uh, some sort of strange perspective on translation. I think it's the opposite. It's gained and found in translation. I think Jewish culture uh, is multicultural, bicultural at least, and uh, in that sense, we all are found and rediscovered in translation. Okay, that's... Can, can what do you think, Dina? I, I, I believe the same. I think Jewish people dispersed so many people, so many languages, at so many different times. Each Jewish writer is a facet, one facet of the enormous multi-faced Jewish existence. Okay. I just wanted to translate for David, maybe. Kadima. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, you do it. You do it better. Не чувствуешь ли себя постоянно в каком-то каком изгнании? Я себя чувствовал в изгнании в Советском Союзе. So what do you think about it? Are you in... מה אתה חושב? כתיבה שלך היא כתיבה בגלות? אני אמרתי שיש פה כל מיני שכבות של שיחה. ואחת השכבות זה כאילו המילה גלות שבאה פה כל הזמן, עולה ויורדת. אני שואלת, אתה, כשאתה כותב, אתה כותב מתוך זהות ישראלית, מקומית, והשפה היא רק בגלות, או שאתה בגלות? אי אפשר להפריד. אני יכול להגיד את זה לפני שאני אומר, אני מאמין בזה שהנציונלית ליטרטורה זה מרדני מיף. זה מרדני מיף. חרושי פיסטל פיסט ללדים, כתורי אומרים לשתת. Они являются неграми, евреями, русскими или эскимосами, которые проживают с белыми медведями. Дубер, ты хочешь делать это? Ты уверен? Ты сказал, что идея национальной литературы это опасный миф, и что реальные писатели не пишут для национальной литературы, они пишут для читателей, будь то белый, черный, ну и что угодно. И да. Ну, евреев я знаю лучше, чем белых медведей. Поэтому я пишу о евреях, а не о белых медведях. But I know Jews better than polar bears, and therefore... Yeah, he said polar bears before. Therefore, I don't write about polar bears, but write about Jews. Да, видно, русский. My father added, but you also... Поэтому я еврейско-русский писатель. So the, the dialogue... No, no this, this is very... Моего брата. This is great. So my father said, but David, and their namesakes, uh, but you also know the Russian people very well, and therefore you write for the Russian people. And David replied, uh, that's why I am a Jewish Russian writer. Right. Jewish Russian is very writer. <laughs> 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 yeah.
אוקיי, תודה רבה, זו הייתה הגדרה טובה מאוד. I would like to ask Maxim to read from his novel, Waiting for America, and I'll read it later in Hebrew. Thank you, Hava. I think you've heard enough of my voice, uh, <laughs> so let me read a very short passage. It's actually, it's not a novel, it's a literary memoir, so it's, it's, it's factually based, but it tells the story in what they used to call, you know, biographie romancée, sort of Bellet Wright's story. Uh, and it takes place in the summer of 1987, uh, after, it starts the day we left Moscow and ends the day we arrived at JFK in New York. So it captures the transit months first in Austria and then in uh, Rome and outside Rome in La Dispoli. But it has a chapter in which my father's <coughs> Israeli uncle, my late grandfather's, one of his brothers, uh, who was a halut who came here on board the Novorossiysk from Odessa uh, in the 20s, uh, he was still alive and he came, he so wanted to see us and of course wanted us to come to, to Israel. He came to visit us in Italy and he spent a week with us. And it was a very intense week. And then we visited Israel, my parents, my mother and father in 1991, <coughs> two, and then I in 1997. So it has an episode as part of a larger chapter, which really is ruminating about what it might have been like had we come to Israel and uh, what it really became without Israel. And so it has a little section about coming to visit this uh, great uncle of mine who was in his 90s and in some ways very strong but in others losing short-term memory, right? Okay, so um, it's very, very short. Over a vegetarian dinner in a dining room overlooking the Mediterranean, Uncle Pina and I spoke in Russian, which the others, native Hebrew speakers, didn't understand. My first wife and I used Russian as a private language when we didn't want the boys to know something, Uncle Pina said to me. But my older son picked up quite a bit, my youngest son, just a couple of words here and there. My second wife and my girlfriends after her have all been from Russia. Papa, how is Verochka, the sculptor poet, the sculptor poet is one of his sons, uh, the sculptor poet asked Uncle Pina in English, who is that, Uncle Pina asked, not one bit bewildered. Verochka, don't you remember? Ah, oh, Verochka. And Uncle Pina turned to me and switched back to Russian. Verochka is my girlfriend. She's younger by quite some years. We tried doing it, you know, but it didn't work. The recent past had ceased to exist, but the distant past was a vast sea on whose waves Uncle Pina still cavorted. I was asking him about his youth in Kramenitz. This is Kamenetz Podolsk in Kamenetsk, and how he, son of a wealthy bourgeois family, first became interested in socialism. Uncle Pina responded with a confession of feeling guilty for something he did, or rather didn't do, as a young man. This was just before he left home for good. His father had asked him to come to synagogue with him for Shabbos, and Pina adamantly refused. I remember this day like it was yesterday. You understand, I've regretted it my whole life. I never saw my father again. I should have come with him. I should have said, the hell with the principal, Uncle Pina said. Does memory feed on unabolished guilt? Or is it guilt like a lamprey that feeds on memory? And here is the translation uh, in Hebrew that was uh, done by Roman Katzman. כעבור יומיים, בצהרי יום שישי, הנכדה הצעירה ביותר של הדוד פיניה אספה אותי ליד מרכז דיזינגוף, ונסענו דרך החום הטבע... התובעני, ש... סליחה, דרך החום התובעני של תל אביב כדי לאסוף את דוד פיניה ולהביאו לבית אביה שעל הים. במשך הארוחה הצמחונית בפינת אוכל המשקיפה לים, דוד פיניה ואני שוחחנו ברוסית. האחרים, צברים דוברי עברית, לא הבינו מילה. העבר הקרוב חדל להתקיים, אבל העבר הרחוק היה ים עצום, ודוד פיניה עדיין היה מקרקר, מקרקר על הגלים. שאלתי אותו על ילדותו בקמניץ, איך הוא בן למשפחה בורגנית עשירה, 
לראשונה גילה עניין בסוציאליזם. בתשובה דודפיניה התוודה שהוא מרגיש אשמה במשהו שהוא עשה, או ליתר דיוק לא עשה כשהיה צעיר. זה היה ממש לפני שעזב את ביתו. אביו קרא לו לבוא איתו לבית הכנסת בשבת, ופיניה סירב בתוקף. אני זוכר את היום ההוא כאילו היה זה אתמול. אתה מבין? אני מצטער על כך במשך כל חיי. מעולם לא ראיתי את אבי יותר. הייתי צריך ללכת איתו. הייתי צריך לזרוק לכל הרוחות את העקרונות. אמר דוד פיניה. האם הזיכרון ניזון מהאשמה בלתי נסלחת? או שמא האשמה היא זו שניזונה כמו צמר ים מהזיכרון?